The Lord be with you. Pat told me this wasn't water. I'm a little disappointed. It's just water. So, um, I can say that because he's not here. I invite you to join with me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter there. We'll be reading chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's not going to be that bad, I promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? (coughs) Now, God, give us ears to hear. Give my voice strength to say your words and not mine. That we hear you and are changed. Be with us, God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, a few years before my grandma died, she fell and broke her hip. She had gotten up in the middle of the night, as she was prone to do, walked out the door of her bedroom, heading down the hall to the kitchen to make a cup of instant coffee, as she was prone to do when she woke up. When a a motion-censored light that my uncle had installed in the hallway flashed on and disoriented Grandma, and she tripped over the loose rug in the hall, and on the way down, probably on impact, broke her hip. She had hip replacement surgery and the subsequent weeks of rehabilitation that uh, take place, and they all happened in the nursing home in Enterprise. It's a lot like here in Jacksonville, therapy and rehabilitation takes place in the nursing home. Now, my grandma swore to us, if we ever put her in a home, she'd kill us. But I'm still alive. And while she may not have technically been in the nursing home, she was in a contiguous part of the building. So whenever my dad and I came to visit her... As soon as she saw us coming down the hall, she'd start into calling us names I feel embarrassed to repeat in mixed company, especially from a pulpit. Now, I don't recall exactly how many weeks she was in rehab, but while she was there, my uncle, who lived with her at the time, decided to change a few things in her house. He pushed the kitchen table up against the wall and found four divots in the linoleum. That table had sat there forever. He reorganized the bathroom, small as it was, just to give a little bit more space for Grandma in case she had a walker or something. He made a clear path in her bedroom from her bed to the door, and he rearranged the furniture in the living room. And while I think he had the best of intentions in doing all of this, whenever we brought Grandma home, all the changes left her confused. And to tell you the truth, I don't think she was ever quite right after that. She wasn't real right before that, but she wasn't quite right after that. I remember she would look around the living room from time to time while I was visiting with her, and she'd say to me, Christopher, when are you going to take me home? I'd say every time, you crazy old lady, you are home. But it all looked different to her. There were literally corners of rooms she hadn't seen in years. Patches of carpet that were different colors because they had not been faded by the sun in use. There were even discolored rectangles and squares on the walls where pictures had been hanging for decades. It was the same place, yet it was completely different. 
And all because a few things had been rearranged, a few corners exposed. For Grandma, the whole place had changed, relocated even. She didn't even believe she was in the right location. All because of a few things had been uncovered. You know, I I can't help but wonder sometimes how this whole place, this whole world, might appear to change, relocate even, if we could just uncover a few things. How the world might look a bit different if we rearrange the furniture of our faith to expose a few darkened corners. How jarring it might be to discover how much we've worn a path around the objects, ideas, and concerns we've used to decorate our consciousness. I wonder, would the world be transformed if we did that? Would we be transformed? I think that's why Paul is having to explain himself in this letter to the Corinthians. He's been preaching this light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, as he calls it. And perhaps he's uncovered something within the believers there at Corinth, something that had been ignored, glazed over, contradicted by these so-called super apostles who were preaching in the area. These other philosophers and preachers who were attempting to woo the congregation at Corinth with other thoughts about life and death and faith and the divine. Paul's words before us, when you read them, I mean, they sound defensive, don't they? And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. I mean, Paul almost sounds like he's nine arguing on the playground. Oh, yeah? Well, if I'm wrong, it's just because you're a duty head. (laughs) But what Paul is getting at, I think, is something much deeper. Something that touches on what I think just might be the biggest conundrum facing the contemporary church. Maybe facing the church of any era. You see, Paul speaks about a veiled gospel. A gospel that can only be identified by its reduced appearance. A veiled gospel that is only only noticeable in the outline. And while there's definitely some connection there Paul's making with Moses and how Moses had to veil his face when he came off Mount Sinai, I think Paul's words are going farther, hinting at what just may be veiling the gospel in the eyes of many today. To tell the truth, it's not one particular issue, though. There are many who would line up at the soapbox to take their turn to plead their case for the singular cause of moral corruption in our present age. But I might be so bold as to say it can be summed up in Paul's further words in the text. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. In other words, when we speak to proclaim the gospel to unveil the truth of God and Christ Jesus to the world, we do not do it in a way that seeks to put ourselves first, to lift ourselves up as some shining example of pious righteousness. When we seek to, as Paul says, let the light shine out of darkness, we do so while proclaiming Jesus is Lord and we are servants, slaves to others. And any other method, Any other message, any other attempt at proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ will always present a veiled gospel. I can remember some years back watching a little video of two rather famous televangelists talking about how they absolutely had to have a private jet to go all over the world to do the Lord's work. I won't tell you who they were, but it definitely wasn't Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis. It was. <laughs> One of them said that he had learned this lesson, this necessity of flying on his own jet from Oral Roberts. Some of you may know Oral Roberts. He began this whole prosperity gospel craze. He said Roberts used to fly airliners, but it got to a place where it was agitating him. What was agitating him? He said, oh, people were coming up to him. He was famous then, and they were wanting him to pray for him and all that. Imagine that. 
a famous preacher and folks wanting him to pray for them. The nerve. They went on to say how a private plane allowed them to do the Lord's work because they could get up and pace back and forth or, or it meant they wouldn't have to be trapped. And these are their words in a long metal tube with all those demons, you know, all those demons traveling to visit family. All those demons going on mission trips, all those demons going to attend conferences and business meetings, those demons flying out of state for experimental cancer treatments. You know, those demons. If we need to keep others at arm's length in order to proclaim the good news of God in Christ Jesus to them. If we need sanitized, private, velvet roped pulpits from which to preach. If we need to make sure that the real awful folks, the real dirty folks, the demons, the real folks are kept out of our way. Then at best, we are preaching a veiled gospel. But of course, it's not just the prosperity preachers who present this distorted gospel to the world. You see, Paul says, we proclaim Jesus Christ. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That proclaiming the good news of Jesus means that there is in fact something about our acts of benevolence that we are more than just doers of good deeds seeking to earn a merit badge. That we are more than people trying to do good so folks will have a few nice things to say about us when we die or an award named in our honor. Proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ means that our lives are lived in such a way that our actions and our words are unmistakably grounded in who Christ is. On the wall in my office, there are a few printed pictures hanging in cheap plastic frames. To tell the truth, uh, they're mostly there to cover over the number of nail holes from multiple other frames that have been there over the years. But in one of those frames, there is a picture of Clarence Jordan. If you don't know who Clarence is, then you and I probably don't know each other very well. But Clarence, uh, on this picture of him, there's this one of my favorite quotes from Clarence. The measure of a Christian is not in the height of his grasp, but in the depth of his love. Clarence embodied that quote, I think. See, Clarence is growing in popularity among some younger folks these days, but in his day, in his lifetime, he was all but despised, especially in his home state of Georgia. In fact, when he died of a heart attack unexpectedly in his cabin at Quantania, they didn't even give him a proper place to be buried. They just buried him out on the farm. But he was despised for preaching a gospel of acceptance and inclusion, most especially when it came to matters of race. Clarence, however, he didn't just live this gospel. He didn't just do it with his actions. He preached it. He didn't just live his life in quietness with other folks at Quantania, the little interracial farming community he started in America's. He preached in whatever church would welcome him into the pulpit. Clarence didn't just live his life, leaving the rest of the world to draw their own conclusions about his motives. Oh, he's just an old goody two-shoe. Oh, he's just somebody wanting to make, make himself famous. Oh, he's just this. No. Clarence was unapologetically vocal about his allegiance and obedience to the calling of Jesus Christ. And as such, I believe Clarence exemplified what's missing from the veiled gospel of my friends on the more progressive and liberal side of Christianity. Clarence was not ashamed to say what, that what he did, that the way he lived was because of Jesus. Because he believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that Jesus meant what he said when he said things like, you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. So today, it seems to me that we are stuck with two options as contemporary Christians. Two veiled gospels in need of transfiguration, in need of having their furniture rearranged, in need of the full light of revelation of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God in Paul's words. 
On the one hand, we can confess with our words that we are Christians. Reciting creeds, signing faith statements, quoting Bible verses, putting them on our cars and stitching them and putting them on our walls. But this veiled gospel places us at the center, fooling us into believing that what matters most is our personal cognitive agreement to some argument that will secure us a seat in heaven. It veils the full orbed truth of Christ's gospel, because as we proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord, yet fail to proclaim ourselves as others slaves for Jesus' sake, we miss the whole gospel. But on the other hand, we are presented with a muted gospel, indistinguishable from the benevolent deeds of those who donate their time and money for the tax benefit. A gospel veiled by the still self-seeking actions of philanthropists hoping to have a wing of their college named after them. Even this half-hearted gospel puts us at the center. For we will all but hide Jesus from the spotlight. No, don't bring religion into it. Don't talk about Jesus. Leave Jesus out of it hoping instead to either pass it off without the embarrassment of faith to the ear of reason or to claim the work as our own, along with all the adoration and praise. It veils the full gospel of Jesus because it flatly fails to do what Paul says. Let light shine out of darkness by giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, I am becoming more and more convinced that what we truly need, what the contemporary church needs, is an unveiled gospel. A gospel that rearranges the furniture, exposes the worn out areas of our rugs of faith, a gospel that shows us the light in the dark corners, a gospel that puts action to our confessions and confessions to our actions. A gospel that demands more from us than pious attitudes with proof texted bumper stickers and politically watered down doctrine. We need an unveiled gospel that demands that our actions are undeniably driven by our faith in Christ and not by our need for comfort, attention, or praise. We need to fully take hold of the whole gospel of Christ, the selfless gospel that always puts Jesus first and everyone else ahead of me. For as Paul says, we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. May we take hold of such an unveiled gospel and live it fully in the power of God's spirit. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us, O Lord, when we choose to pursue a veiled gospel, a half gospel, one that we choose to proclaim only with our words, or one, Lord, that is muted in our actions. God, help us to take hold of the full gospel, one in which our lives are unmistakably tied to you, the truth of who you are, that our very words and our deeds reflect the truth of your gospel. Holy God, be with us now as we listen for your Holy Spirit. Call us, Lord, to whatever it is you would have us to do this morning and give us the strength and the courage to step out on faith and do it. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.